I like to think there's a shift. There's a shift that's gathering steam, if you like, where people are going, actually, I can challenge what I've done. You don't have to challenge anybody else. What anyone else is doing is their journey. And they'll and it's make our conversation and previous experiences is making me think, do we all need to reevaluate what we've been taught, not even in the saddle, but just in the way that we've been around our horses and that we are around our horses yes. and what we think is acceptable and what isn't. You've got to be vulnerable enough to say, I want to change. If you don't want to change, you're never going to change. But I think there's a lot of people who are doing things in a certain way and they know in their gut it's not right, is that for the most part we can be too controlling, too much of a perfectionist, Hello and welcome to the Curious Equestrian podcast with me, Anna Louise. Now, you might know today's guest from a beautiful documentary called Taming Wild Pura Vida, all about an incredible journey on foot and on horseback with rescue Costa Rican horses. Andrea Wadey is the equine relationship specialist featured in the film and she's also an author, emphasising the importance of understanding horses for a strong connection in all of her work. With over 40 years of equine experience, Andrea believes in embracing different approaches and letting horses be themselves. She challenges the extremes of dominating and instead encourages balanced partnerships based on mutual understanding. Andrea, welcome to the podcast. Wow, what an introduction. Thank you so much. I'm really happy well, to be here. Thank you. We are thrilled to have you. Take us back, Andrea, to the start of your journey. When did your mindset change from domination to having that mutual connection with horses? <laughs> I was lying flat on my back in a field, having just come off my horse, watching the clouds go by going, well, that hurt, and I'm really fed up with this. And, um, yeah, that's when I felt like things had to change. Um, I wouldn't say that dominance can never exist. Um, I like to call dominance insistence, and there are times when I have to insist. It might be a safety issue or, you know, if my horse is about to, I don't know, stand on a glass bottle that's been dropped on a trail, I will go to dominance. But I'll always try and say to myself, is there a, was it needed? Was it necessarily, was there another way I could have done it? And nearly every time it's actually, yes, there's another way I could have done that. Um, so I try not to use it. But, you know, I think it's all part of a journey, isn't it? you know certain ways of training work for certain horses and then you always meet that one horse that challenges that and how much control does it take in that moment andrea to actually not use your own emotions as fuel and to take a breath and think about your approach with a horse i think the more times that you do fall back on your emotions you realize it doesn't work and actually it's really destructive and it creates really difficult patterns so it becomes easier to not do it because you know it doesn't work or that it causes things to blow up or afterwards you feel remorse or guilt or just you feel crappy about it so i think it's learning to have self-control and hey i'm i'm not perfect there's times when i don't have it <laughs> I try, but everyone gets pushed sometimes. But for the most part, I think um, non-violence is really important to me. It's really important to me. And I've experienced violence in my life in different forms. And I know that it's not a way that I want to ever work with animals. But I have. In the past, I've made those mistakes. Um just like everybody and if I could go back and beg forgiveness I would but what I did instead was learn from it and there was a really big turning point for me with a trainer called David Lichman if you've ever heard of David Lichman from America he's a very dear friend of mine and I have pretty much where I am today is because of him because I remember waltzing into a clinic of his and I was like, oh, prelly, schmelly, what do they know? But 
there was nothing else around when I lived in Costa Rica and I wanted to go and my ego was the size of the planet. <laughs> and I walked in and he asked me a question and I was like, oh yeah, I've used a tie down on my horse. You know, this I'm talking, this was 20 odd years, yeah, 20 years ago probably. And he said to me, oh, just sit down on this bucket a minute. May I, may I touch you? Can I do something? I'm like, yeah, no problem. And he took a rope and he very gently placed it behind my head and around my feet so that my head was in the same position as a loose tie down on a horse. And I felt sick. I felt violated and everything changed. And I thought I will never, ever, ever do that to a horse again. So that was just the starting point, really, of then going, I don't know anything about horses. I thought I did, but I don't. And I remember going up to him and just saying, I, I want to learn. Um, so I think it's do you think, being a... Do you think, Andrew, it will take that sort of demonstration for the wider equestrian industry that may still use violence, you know, on varying levels uh, in their training or severe tack, perhaps? Do you think it takes that kind of demonstration to have a bit of a shock effect on humans to, to stop them in their tracks? Yeah, I think it can help. The problem is that I see sometimes in the horse world is that egos get very caught up in things. And I had a giant ego. I mean, everyone has an ego. But you've got to be vulnerable enough to say, I want to change. If you don't want to change, you're never going to change. But I think there's a lot of people who are doing things in a certain way and they know in their gut it's not right. But it's very hard when you're seen as being someone of authority, maybe it's a, an instructor or a trainer, for them to turn around and go, actually, what I'm doing isn't right, I want to change it. That's really hard for people to do that when their livelihoods depend on it and their reputation depends on it. But there's a lot of people that have who've been incredibly successful. I mean, case in point, Warwick Schiller, brilliant horseman, who's been vulnerable enough to go, hey, I want to change the way I'm doing things. And I'm not, not saying that that he used violence but he's been on a journey as have a lot of people and I like to think there's a shift there's a shift that's gathering steam if you like where people are going actually I can challenge what I've done you don't have to challenge anybody else what anyone else is doing is their journey and they'll change when they're ready or they won't and no amount of banging a drum is going to make that happen and I, I I think do what you do try and change where you can and and just just try and what am I trying to say like trying to change the industry from one person is very very challenging but if enough people make a change and people start to go what are they doing with their horse no way that's cool I want to do that if we blow up the bridge when people are trying to cross it by criticizing and pointing out what they're doing wrong they're unlikely to step on that bridge and walk across it. So I always try and say, I'll meet you wherever you are. And if you're interested, I'll share. If you're not, that's up to you. And criticism, I think we can all agree on as horse owners, is a big part of the, sadly, the equestrian industry, whether it's at livery yards or whether it's at demonstrations yeah. or workshops or wherever yeah. you go, clinics, a, a lot of gossip happens, a lot of... Mm sort of talking about other people's horses mm. in front of the owners how do you think we change that from the inside out even just as a horse owner but also as professionals like yourself in the industry lead by example just don't do it just don't do it and if it's happening around you walk away don't get sucked in smile and say thank you for your opinion and walk away and it can be lonely, I'll tell you that. It can be quite lonely when you choose to take a different path. And I hear that all the time from students going, people think I'm crazy. People are saying I'm being irresponsible. People, it's like, you know what, just smile and say thank you. Thank you and walk away. But it is hard. It's really hard. Um, I'm actually doing a webinar this week called Wise Riders aimed at older riders, riders over 50. And I tell you, as hard as the industry is for younger people, it is brutal for older people of how discounted they get or how 
their wisdom and knowledge that they've gathered through their whole life, like I want a peaceful life, I don't want to use violence and too much dominance, when they try and apply that with their horses, they're judged as being worthless, stupid, all of those things. And it's really hard. It makes people step back in the river and try and resist the change. But yeah, it's challenging. And I think as an industry, we need to stop seeing it all as them and us um, because that creates more division. The very division you're trying to stop, you create by creating this them and us. And I think um, criticism doesn't need to be thrown across the bridge from either side. I think we do what we do, do it well, and hopefully inspire some people along the way. And I think we can all hear from your journey alone as well, Andrea, that working with horses makes us face a lot of things about ourselves as well, doesn't it? It really, oh, they yeah. say horses are mirrors to us, but it sounds as if that's been a big part in your journey. Yeah, definitely. And I think that um, not only do they mirror us to a certain degree, I don't think it's in, I think sometimes that can be taken too far. You know, I've seen horses with real behavioural problems where someone's like, oh, you've got anger. That's why the horse is doing this. I think sometimes that can be a little bit of a dangerous mindset because it can start to apportion blame when horses actually have their own personalities, their own traumas, their own gathering of experiences. But yes, to a certain degree, we've all seen the situation where someone's really nervous and anxious and their horse is flighty and then they get passed into the hands of someone who's calm and the horse becomes calm. So there's a mirror in that respect. But I think it also, if you're able to slow down enough and pay attention enough, we can really start to see micro signals, personalities, feedback in our horses. So not just in, oh, they're mirroring me, but wow, how is my behaviour influencing them? That's where some of my biggest shifts came, I think. And tell us about Zeus, because in your book, Crossing Bridges, it follows your journey with your horse, Zeus, and how significant has he been in your life? He was amazing. He changed my life completely. Um, to have that time to be completely present with a horse from dawn till dusk with no distractions other than one foot in front of the other creating that bond it was some of the well probably the best month of my life really it was incredible and I learned so much from him so so much from him and a lot about myself and, you know, how much of a control freak I was, even though I was <laughs> 10 years into my journey of doing stuff different. It's like, oh, hello, me. God, <laughs> you know, and yeah, it was it was really cool because I realized even though I realized a lot of things about myself, I also realized you can't change everything about yourself. We have certain traits and that a relationship can still be achieved and can still be really, really special, even though we're far from perfect. I think we've all had those moments, haven't we, with horses in our lives that have made us face something. I know I certainly have. When I went through a period of real uncertainty, a big relocation and house move, I didn't realise why my horse's behaviours changed towards me. And I realised it's because I was anxious and I was uptight and I was feeling lost. Yeah in this new county and she was behaving quite anxious and uptight with me and I've suddenly yeah. it, it clicked one day when when we were just spending time together at Liberty in the field and I thought oh gosh you're totally feeding off of me and I'm showing yeah. you this you know not very likable side of me and and you're just giving it back then and from that day on I vowed to leave the issues at the gate that I was facing in my life at that particular time which is you know, or be, easier said or be than honest done. Yeah, or yeah. be honest about them. You know, I had a magnificent lesson from a horse in Poland. I was training with Anna Marciniak in Poland, who's a fantastic trainer. And um, I was working with her horse, Vivian. And I always remember, and again, here comes the ego. So I was working on um, Piaf, working towards Liberty Piaf, and it was fabulous I was, was having an amazing time and she was like that was great that all went really well I think I was actually online at that point and she said I'm gonna go and get the video well of course I changed 
instantly because I was like, oh, video. The horse turned, walked away from me, and I kid you not, walked straight up to the doors of the arena, double barreled them with her legs. They opened the door and she took herself back to the stable because that's how it was all set up there. These horses were all at liberty. And yeah. Anna said, well, you blew that. And I went into the, oh, well, it's a really good lesson. You know, I obviously wasn't calm. La, la, la. And she goes, oh, my God, you're such a liar. You're really angry at yourself. And I was like, no, no, I think it was a great lesson. She goes, honestly, the horse knows you're lying. And I was like, oh, my God, you know what? You're right. I am really annoyed at myself. She said, great, go and kick the wall. So I kicked the wall and was like, God, I can't believe I let my ego get in the way of such a beautiful connection with that horse. La, 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 la. Lo and behold, back in the arena comes the horse straight into PF. And I just no. went, wow. And that blew my mind. I mean, her horses were incredibly well trained. Wow. It certainly wasn't down to any skill that I had. Her horses were incredibly well trained. But the feedback was so real and so exactly on point. So my thing is, is yes, you can try and leave everything at the gate, but you are still human and it's better to go in and be honest. It's when we try and pretend mm. to not be stressed, to pretend to not be scared. The horse is like, I don't now I'm worried because I can't read you. I can't read you. I don't know what this mask is, you know, and they're incredible just like we know when our friends are not telling the truth or our friends are acting strange we feel it if you have a good relationship with your horse it's no different mm. they know they know when we're being defensive and we're trying to mask what's going on behind yeah, yeah. closed doors it's absolutely fascinating and it but causes causes such yeah, a disconnection mm. it just causes yes. such a disconnection mm. it's better to be and honest um and Isn't go that an incredible you know. an incredible form of counseling andrea wouldn't you say because in a way they're visualizing and uh, something with we're, we're internalizing so in a way it's making us face what we're feeling how we're portraying ourselves what we're putting out to the world and making us deal with what we're yeah, putting out there, which actually can be you know a real sort of it can be it can really hit us can't it if we're not prepared for what we're actually putting out there very absolutely fascinating absolutely fascinating and i mentioned yeah. earlier the documentary the beautiful film taming wild pure vida and you work to build trust with the rescue horses in costa rica what did you learn about building that trust and connection with horses that maybe we can take from as well that we can all take from as equestrians andrea you're all going too fast <laughs> That was my biggest take home. Mm. I was going too fast, even when I thought I was going slowly, when I thought I was being connected. You know, you think about how horses are in the field when they stand and look at something and they listen and they smell. We process so fast. We look up. Oh, yeah, no, there's nothing. Boom, let's go. And the horse is like, whoa, I'm still smelling. I'm still listening to the birds. I'm still assessing now don't get me wrong horses can assess in a millisecond if they think their life depends on it but we are perpetually rushing our horses come on i mean it's just what you hear all day long around horses and what you're saying is what you're giving me is not enough i want more that's what the clicking is give me more than what you're giving me now how about we give the horses what they're asking for, which is a little more time? And in, for some people, it might be speed up. I see some people whose horses process really fast and they're going, Woo, Zen. It's like, no, 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 this horse wants you to move. You know, so depending on your horse, but we are always wanting more. And that must be really hard for the horses. And how did, when you realised that communication, Andrew, and what your horse was trying to tell you, 
how did that make you reevaluate the journey and what did you get from the experience that must have really deepened your enjoyment of the whole process and also at times yeah. I guess made you sit in some more difficult places if you were feeling exhausted or sore or tired for me it just took all the pressure away and I a thing that I realized is the less I nagged and the less I wanted more the more he gave me and, you know, I'm starting a young horse now, my personal horse um, here in England. And the way that I've started her is I've waited for her to offer everything. And it has come so beautifully and so naturally. She offered me a canter under saddle for the first time today. Mm. And it was beautiful. It was her idea. I was like, that was great. And lo and behold, my humanness came up and we carried on up the lane. I was like, let's do it again. <laughs> and as soon as I brought my energy up, she stopped dead and pinned her ears as if to say, that was not the deal. Now, that's not me to say that later on in life, I will ask, you know, I do ask her to do things. But this was something that she is just finding balance with. She is just learning to offer. And then I reward the offer but I just had to ask again and I blew it so it's still it's a lifelong journey we're overcoming ourselves constantly but I've also learned there's no point in trying to be a zen monk you know meditating in a cave that's not who I am I process really fast I move really fast I do a million things a day but when I'm with my horse, I try to be as calm and quiet, as slow as I'm capable of. It's still probably not enough for most horses, but I constantly practice and that's all you can do. And when you get it wrong, you say sorry and then you go, OK, let's try again. Let's start again. Let me slow down again. You've got to forgive yourself. So interesting. So interesting what you mentioned about working with your youngster and the, the canter transition, how do you get that balance right? Because I think, again, it comes back to the equestrian sphere as a whole. I've got beloved equestrian friends that I've grown up with and, and love them with all my whole heart. But all sorts of equine friends over the years have said to me, don't let your horse do that. Or, you know, you've got to win in that situation or you've got to end on a good note in something that we deem as a good note. How do we get that balance of listening to our horse and what they want to do in a scenario and also not thinking actually they've got the upper hand here? I don't really hold with that upper hand thing for my own relationship with my horse because I am willing to step into insistence if I need to. But what I've realised is when I step into insistence or dominance, the feel that I get between myself and my horse just doesn't feel as nice as when I offer it. And yet my progress seems just as fast with her. I mean, it's not as fast as if the horse gets sent away for a six week training, which is just not my style. When I wait for her to offer, it is equally as quick, but the feel is just out of this world and it doesn't come from cues it comes from a swell of energy between us and I think it's coming and I smile to the idea that we're going to canter boom she goes into it and it's beautiful there's no other feeling like it for me so the more you feel that that's what you want and when you step out of that into insistence and you get it but it just doesn't feel right it 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 just leaves a yucky taste in your mouth for me anyway it's got to be a feeling and an instinct with your horse in, in, that, in that connection and in that moment it's got to be together for me mm. and when in that moment andrew did you wrestle when you were transitioning into this way of communicating with your horse did you wrestle with that previous way of being and i think we're and this may be not true for you, but I think a lot of equestrians are taught when they first start riding as a child, you know, all of the transitions, all of the cues, you've got, they've got to listen to you, you've got to do it this way. How difficult was it for you to shift 
something that I guess is ingrained almost like muscle memory in, in the way that you ride. Yeah, it's really hard. I mean, I started riding, I've got photos of me on a horse at 18 months old and it was show them who's boss, don't let them get away with it. And yeah, I won't lie, there's maybe 1% of me that wishes I never went down this path because once you've opened this lid, you can't unsee it. You can't unfeel it. I can't go and enjoy a day across country with my friends because for me it's torture. Is there part of me that thinks it would have been easier never to start down this road? Absolutely. But then I remember how it feels and I just can't, I couldn't go back. Do I ever wrestle with it? Of course. There are times when I will forget myself. Usually it'll be in a fear situation. There's not many situations where I feel scared on a horse or in a situation on the ground, but there's been some. I mean, in some of the clinics, I've had very challenging horses and I have stepped into dominance because I needed to stay safe. So it's not that I won't go there. I just would rather choose another way if I can. But in answer to your question, did I wrestle with it at the start? Absolutely. It's like anything. When you decide to live in a different way, it can take time for that habit to build, for the new neuro pathways to be created. But it just takes a few tastes of that feel that you just really want to keep going with it but yeah I mean it's challenging everyone's human and you're going to have times where you fall back into old habits or something will trigger you to go into controlling or whatever and you know and I, I, I don't want anyone to misunderstand there are plenty of times when I say to my horse my young horse no this has to happen right now just like I would in any relationship be it my family my my husband my dogs I will always try and find the path of least resistance. I'll always try and find a peaceful way through everything. But I'm also going to stand up for myself. And if a horse is really pushing on me or threatening me or hurting me, absolutely I'm going to say, no, that's not going to happen. But the difference is, is I don't get emotion with it. It's like, good, the dumb, over. And then can you be light again? Can you follow me at liberty again? Great. And it's over. And you see it. You know, I don't hold with the form of horsemanship where we say, well, you know, horses kick each other in the field. Therefore, you can smack it and it's fine. That's not that's not that doesn't work for me. But I have watched horses for hours and hours and hours. And when they do have a disagreement, it's quick, it's sharp, it's over. It's mm. done. So don't if you go down this path don't think you're never going to disagree with your horse because you probably are at some point because everyone has different opinions on things mm. but it's how you go through that and without emotion without feeling like it's really personal without resorting to anger or violence and it's not an argument it's not a, a tug of war i think you know we can Sometimes, you know, as humans that have arguments with whoever we might be arguing with, we need to realise that we don't argue with our horses. Like you say, it's, it's a conversation, it's a disagreement, it's an instruction. It's not a, a snappy argument where fueled by emotion. That's yeah, really great way of putting it. And um, back to the documentary, because I've got to tap into this. But traversing Costa Rica from the Pacific to the Atlantic Ocean is such an extraordinary journey. Can you share a memorable moment that sticks in your mind right now where you felt a breakthrough or something incredible in your connection with the horses during this yes. country adventure? I think for me, well, there were two things. One touches back a little bit into the falling back into your old ways with horses. Um, and obviously I made the trek with Elsa Sinclair, who is an incredible horsewoman you need to get her on this podcast she's amazing and she takes the passive approach with horses way way further than me she's an absolute goddess with horses and it was day one and I was super emotional and I was nervous and excited and it was just months of planning had come together in this moment and Zeus kept walking through me and trying to walk over me and I can remember just going oh my gosh if this horse bashes into me one more time 
And the old way of being would have been, don't let him do that. Get him out of your space. Stand your ground. All I could hear was Elsa laughing and she went, how can he stand on you if you're not there? Think about that for a minute. How can he step on you if you are not there? I.e. move. Yeah, now, a well. lot of natural horsemanship, people, they'd be like, don't move your feet. That horse is pushing on you. No. Oh, if I'm going, yeah. if I'm going, oh, oh, he's stepping on me. OK, then he's pushing on me. But if I go, I'm yeah. standing here. Actually, no, I'm standing here. I choose here. It changed everything in a heartbeat. And he's like, where are we going? What are we doing? Awesome. But where there was a real breakthrough for me, we were going, Elsa and I were going down this hill and it was insane. No one should ever have taken a horse down this hill, but we had little choice at this point. We couldn't go back and we couldn't go forward. And we've always said if we knew what we were going to go through, we never would have done it. We never would have done it. But it was too late. We were in. So we were going down this hill and it was like this. It was hugely steep. And um, there was massive ravines right down through the middle and we were having to like climb over it. And Zeus was really on his forehand and kept trying to run down this hill. Well, it was lethal. It was absolutely lethal. And I, my knee was hurting and I'm tugging on him. I totally reverted. And I'm just like, please slow down. Don't do that. And I can feel my emotions coming up and I want to cry. I want to shout. I'm exhausted i'm boiling hot and he just wants to run down this hill which i could barely walk down oh. and something just snapped in me and i just started running i was like you want to run i'm going to run i'm just going to run and i had a huge long rope that was really thin because we weren't using training ropes or anything like that it was just tiny little ropes like thinner than my little finger way way thinner um so i just started running and it was incredible because he was mirroring me. He was fussing and trying to run because my emotions were coming up. I was getting anxious. I was tired. I was overwhelmed. He started to become fractious. I ended up just going, stuff it, <laughs> running down the hill, laughing my head off like a complete lunatic. And Elsa's at the bottom of the hill looking up going, oh boy, she's gone. She's lost it. And, you know, Zeus took four strides of running with me and then he just slid onto his haunches and was like, slow down. And he slowed me down and we walked down the hill perfectly together. And that was a real turning point for me, that I was able to find myself going down this road that was not going to end anywhere good and then just going, stop, stop, stop. What are you doing? And I didn't know what else to do. So I, I, I turned that anger and frustration into excitement and just started running. And from that day forward, my relationship with that horse changed completely. And it sounds bonkers because it was. It was. I don't know what I was doing or why I did it, but it worked. And for those listening, I'm sure on their minds as much as it is on my mind, Zeus could have just galloped into the distance, right? He oh, yeah. left you for dust. How yeah. did you know, Andrea, that he would stay with you throughout this journey and he wouldn't just choose to take himself off? I didn't. I didn't know. He was still free to do whatever he wanted. But um, those horses blew my mind. When we went through the Indigenous Zone, it was the hardest thing I have ever done in my life. And I write about it in the book so the film i love the film i believe in every single bit of it that was elsa's story of the trek and it was beautiful and i love it the book is my my story of the trek and we both support each other hugely and are very very dear friends but um i talk in the book about the indigenous zone and it was so hard it was the hardest thing i've ever done in my life and the horses were incredible. We were able to send them up. We were, I say we were able. We weren't doing it. We were like, we can't keep up. So they would go ahead and they'd, they'd wait at the top. Um, Elsa's horse did that several times when Elsa was struggling because we were in like thigh deep mud and the horses could like pile through it. Um, and I remember saying to her after 
that day we sat on this piece of wood somewhere and we were both just going I think we've ruined everything I don't you know we've either just cemented our relationship with them for life or we've spent every single penny in the emotional bank that we'd built up with our horses and the next day was the best and I think sometimes adversity can create a really strong bond I'm not suggesting people go out and look for adversity but when it comes on you if you can be honest about your emotions and try not to project your emotion onto your horse but the bond can really really become very cemented in adversity do you think also it's really interesting what strikes me as well Andrea from what you're saying is that do you also think that we're so focused on who our horses are, whether they're listening to us, what they're doing, how they're performing. Is it also about actually us being nice people that they want to be around and that they want to stay with and choose to spend time with? And actually, should we be looking a little bit less at our horses as people and look at ourselves and our own behaviours and manners and spatial awareness? Absolutely. Absolutely. When you watch a herd, it's a very complex conversation that's going on a lot. There isn't, you know, they've debunked about there being, you know, like the dominant member, you know, the head, whatever in the herd. And it's like, it's about how we want things in our life, I think, is respect, understanding and kindness. But we focus too much on what the horses can do for us. <laughs> It's like, what can we learn about ourselves in our journey with our horses? And that is that for the most part, we can be too controlling, too much of a perfectionist, you know, and and, uh, and you can go, you know, deeply into that. But it's I, I feel that we need to look to ourselves hugely and it doesn't mean that you have to give up your goals. It doesn't mean that you have to give up your dreams, but you can find a different pathway you know we're following a lot of the time a form of horsemanship that was started when we were fighting wars it, it it's not it doesn't have to be that way anymore you know it, it it just doesn't and but it takes it takes guts to go you know what i'm going to try something different and what often will happen is you'll realize you don't have a relationship with your horse you thought you did. But when you take all of those pressures away from your horse, you suddenly go, oh, my goodness, now I really do see what's in front of me. But the thing that's beautiful about horses is they're always waiting for us to change. And they're very forgiving. They're very forgiving. But the way that we behave about them, around them, it's been scientifically proven. I can't remember right now what the study was, but they had some horses in in a stable sort of environment and they would show them pictures of different emotions so a happy face um a crying face a laughing face an angry face okay and they showed these to the horses and then let's say the horse they showed the happy face to they then brought the happy person in and the horse really wanted to connect with that person that they'd seen in the picture they showed the angry face and when the person that had made the angry face came into the stable, the horse turned and went and stood in the corner. They wow. can read emotions. They know what you're feeling. So when you get frustrated at them because they're not in the perfect outline or they've not cleared the jump well enough, they know. And it's really hard on them. Judgment on horses. I think they feel it a very deep level. Um, I can remember one horse in particular in Costa Rica and I and actually this is kind of the other end of the spectrum but it's something that I hear people do all the time and I rescued a lot of horses in Costa Rica and why I'm telling this story is because it's about the judgment and I ha I was doing a clinic with Dr Jennifer Zeligs who's a really great trainer from America and we used to bring people to our yard in Costa Rica to study with different people that I wanted to study with. Basically, <laughs> it worked out great. So she was there to teach. I was introducing everyone to their horses. And I bought out this one horse, Canelo, that I'd rescued. And I said, you know, this is Canelo. 
He's a beautiful boy. He's had a really rough time of it. He got beaten in his former home. La, 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 la. And everyone's like, oh, poor horse. And they're all looking at him. She pulled me away and went, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm introducing the horse. And she was like, no, you're not. You're setting him up to fail immediately. Like the shame on that horse's face was shocking to me. And I was like, I'd never even thought of it. From that day, I completely changed. And again, you say, you know, how do you change? Direct experience makes you change. Mm. So I had a direct experience. I thought, I'm not going to do that again. So I would introduce him then. This is Canelo. He's magnificent. That horse changed his entire body shape. His entire outlook changed. His top line changed, not through any training, but through the judgments that we were putting on that horse. And I know that sounds crazy, but I saw it happen so many times. Don't judge them. Don't so label them. Don't on, talk bad in front of them because they know. Just like you mm. could be stood with someone who speaks a different language to you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you could be talking to someone who speaks a foreign language to you. Let's say someone stood in front of you speaking, I don't know, German, and you don't speak German. You know if they're talking nicely about you or not, and you'll feel judged. It's the same for the horses. You can know, can't you, through tone and expression and posture and energy even. I think, you know, the, the word energy gets banded around, but it's so true in what you do pick up that is non-verbal. And I think we have to remember that around our horses, even, and, and we can use that on a smaller scale, because obviously you're, you know, at a clinic in front of an audience, we might have a vet visit and we're saying, oh, you know, be careful because actually doesn't like this or doesn't behave in a certain way here or a bit anxious about that. And actually the horse is picking up on how we are communicating yeah. our horse to them, which is really interesting. And also, I love how you were saying about your story with Zeus about getting out of his way. And actually, that is okay. If we want to give our horses a bit of space, it doesn't mean they are dominating us or that they have got power in that situation. Do you find as well, do you think, Andrew, that however old or young we are as equestrians, whether we're, you know, teenagers starting out or older in the industry, horse owners, horse riders training, that we need to look at what we've been taught over the years and reframe that. Because it's made me think, I mean, I thought years ago about someone who said to me, they corrected me for letting my young mare, after a training session, rub her head on my side. I saw that as I took it what it of I took of it what it was. I thought she, you know, she's had an interesting hard training session. She is rubbing her itchy face now that I've untacked her on my side. And actually, just as a child might tug at you or, you know, have that physical interaction, she is just rubbing herself on my side to itch her sweaty face. But uh, someone in my sphere said to me, don't let your mare do that. That is disrespectful. You must tell her off now, you know. And I, obviously, I didn't. And I said, "Oh no, she's absolutely fine." But it's make our conversation and previous experiences is making me think: Do we all need to reevaluate what we've been taught? Not even in the saddle, but just in the way that we've been around our horses and that we are around our horses, yes. and what we think is acceptable and what isn't. I think. I think things move in stages, don't they? It's like how we behaved emotionally when we we're 18 is different to how we behave emotionally now with or without horses. I don't know that you've always got to put it in a good or bad, positive or negative. You can go, I just don't want to do it that way anymore. Or this feels good. I want to carry on doing it like this. Because let's face it. We all want to feel good all of the time. Nobody likes to feel angry or likes to feel sad. So if there's a way where we can be in our horsemanship where things feel good most of the time, that's what we want to repeat. However, 
there does come a certain amount of challenging tradition and it's really really hard when everyone around you is doing things in a certain way and you step out of the box you get ridiculed you get told that you're you're crazy that you're causing problems for your horse etc etc that takes an awful lot of strength of character to still carry on regardless of that but what i say to people it's a bit like baking a cake learn from everybody everyone that you can learn from them take a piece of that ingredients but only use what you want to make your own cake so you might go to a clinic and look and go, that is not working for me. That's OK. Don't do it. Don't do it. But take you might find one little pearl of wisdom and it might even be I've learned that I don't want to do it like that. That's OK. I think the hardest thing that horse people who are trying to do things differently, the hardest thing that they face is judgment. And none of us like being judged. None of us like to be the odd one out and left out of situations. And that's what happens quite often when you start to go down a different road. But what's lovely is quite often you will go down that road and be willing to carry on. And then some of the very people that had judged you may well go, what you're doing might help my horse. And then you go, wow, that's really cool. Because a lot of the times people that are judging are coming from a place of fear themselves. Mm. And, you know, I think I was one of those people when I was 18 or 19. You know, show the horse who's boss. It's because really underneath it all, you want to find a different way as well. But you've not, you don't know who to ask. You don't know how to ask. You don't want to look like you don't know what you're doing or that you're not in a place of being in control of everything and it's really hard again it comes back to our own our own personalities and our own stuff that we're dealing with and like you said do we look at the horse's behavior or do we look at ours we probably need to look at ours Andrea, thank you so much for coming on the Curious Equestrian podcast. For those who are listening and thinking of all those questions, how can I change? What do I need to do? What resources have you got? How can they find you, follow you, attend your clinics? Yeah, sure. So probably the best place to go is my website, which is www.andreawady.com. Um, you can also find me through Horse Class. They have my online course. And then, of course, my book is on Amazon, um, Crossing Bridges. But it's been so fun. I've really, really enjoyed this conversation. And it's, it can go in so many directions. But if anyone you know, has questions, feel free to email me through the website. And Andrew, I think we could talk for hours and hours on end yeah. and delve into all of this. It's been absolutely fascinating. So thank you so much. And for those listening, please do subscribe to the Curious Equestrian podcast. Find us on social media and make sure you follow the journey for more inspiring guests. And we'll see you next time. <laughs>